Welcome to this podcast on rare diseases. The next 15 minutes, we focus on the early detection of patients with Fabry disease. How can we as cardiologists, neurologists or nephrologists set up a better screening for Fabry disease? Katrien van Elk visits a Belgian expert on this disease. We are at the University Hospital in Leuven right now, where Professor David Kassiman is working and we are going to pay him a visit to talk about rare diseases. Professor Kassiman is staff member in the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and also the head of the Metabolic Center for Adults and Children at UZ Leuven. He has an extensive experience in rare diseases. He's not only well known in Belgium for his expertise, but also internationally. In other words, the ideal guest to give some guidance on how to improve the early detection of Fabry disease. Hi, Professor Kassiman. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Fine, thank you. As introduction, can you enlighten a bit the current situation of Fabry disease in Belgium? I think overall some around 200 patients with Fabry disease have been diagnosed in Belgium over the last decades. Uh, enormous efforts have been done to, to trace patients and to identify new patients and especially also to screen their families. And uh, that has led to the diagnosis of, of these uh, patients. But we actually think looking at countries uh, surrounding us, that there should be more Fabry patients in Belgium, actually, that we would only have around half of the, the uh, patients genetically predisposed to develop Fabry disease that are identified right now. So uh, what should doctors know about rare diseases and more specific uh, Fabry disease? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, we all learn that rare diseases are rare and therefore there shouldn't be on the top of our differential diagnosis list, but um, what we cannot do is forget about them when our differential diagnosis starts to run out. And we also have to make sure that we think of them when it's appropriate or justified. So when patients present with a panel of complaints or organ involvement that suggests something more than a common disease, uh, especially in young uh, people, you do not expect several organs at the same time to, uh, to pose problems or to, uh, to have issues. And uh, in more specifically in the case of Fabry disease, uh, these patients tend to present to different specialties because the disease is a systemic disease. It's a lysosomal storage disease that can affect different organs and tissues. And mainly the heart, the kidney and the brain are involved. So these patients can present first uh, to a neurologist or first to a cardiologist or first to a nephrologist. And of course, they will first present to uh, family physicians with uh, the, the problems they have. So what colleagues uh, should remember is that rare diseases do exist. And if young patients present with different organs or systems that are failing, then that uh, should not be attributed to different diseases. But at least we have to try to capture these things as one disease. And therefore, we have to look further for rarer diseases that could explain the, the phenotype of these, uh, these patients. Besides that, of course, uh, it's important to know that the, uh, looking at a family pedigree can be really helpful um, to determine if there is a disease running in the family or not. Uh, and then, of course, to interpret uh, a pedigree, you have to be aware of the different modes of inheritance of diseases. You have the recessive that uh, most commonly occurs only in one generation. So it's the siblings that could have the same disease at a, a frequency of, of uh, one in four. Then you have dominant diseases that go from generation to generation at a frequency of half of the uh, the the children that can also have the same 
genetic disease. And then you have the more complicated modes of inheritance, like the X-linked, and then there's X-linked dominant, X-linked recessive. And in the case of Fabry disease, that's a funny story. Historically, it was considered an X-linked recessive disease, so the females would not be affected by the genetic defect. While in reality, we know now that that is really not the case. Uh, it's, it's males and females are affected by the X-linked genetic defect equally. It's just that females have a second X chromosome and therefore their disease or the manifestations of the disease only occur a bit later and can be a bit milder than in males who have the disadvantage of having only one X chromosome. Now, we know that uh, early diagnosis in rare diseases is very important. So why? Well, first of all, it's important for patients and their families that a diagnosis is made because otherwise they remain in, in some kind of darkness where they have complaints or they have disease and there is no explanation for, for their complaints or their disease, which is a very un uncomfortable situation. So just because of that, it's, it's already important to, uh, to diagnose patients and to put a label on their pattern of complaints, pattern of disease. Secondly, if it's a genetic disease, it becomes important for the rest of the family and, and siblings uh, wanting to have children, uh, uh, etc. So it, it becomes important for counseling of the family to have a, a definite diagnosis that allows you to instruct um, patients and their families about the risk of recurrence in, in, in other pregnancies, in, in next generations and so on. So that is important. And then, of course, uh, for the minority of rare diseases for which uh, a treatment is available, it is absolutely paramount that these diagnoses are made because you're missing opportunity to treat patients if you don't diagnose them. And the sooner you diagnose them, the sooner you can start treatment. And therefore, the, uh, the higher the uh, probability of success of your treatment. So if there's a treatment, it's a medical failure if you don't diagnose them. And of course, the, the rarer the disease, the higher the probability that the diagnosis will be made late or will not be made. And, and that uh, constitutes loss of opportunity for patients and their families. And do you have a specific advice for cardiologists, nephrologists or neurologists regarding screening for Fabry disease? Yes, absolutely. What we've uh, noticed over the over the years is that colleagues and even uh, ourselves, we can be motivated to screen, but there's uh, something called screening fatigue. If you screen a cohort of patients for a specific disease and you don't find any, that becomes frustrating and then people stop screening. So the main advice is do not grow tired of screening for these rare diseases. You might not find any, but if you do find them, it's worthwhile. And then especially in all the populations where it has been shown to be relevant to screen, for instance, young stroke patients, uh, patients with arrhythmia, patients with hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, patients with unexplained proteinuria or unexplained uh, renal failure at young age, certainly, but also at older age, patients in dialysis that uh, for, for which there is no, no good explanation uh, for their, their renal failure. In all those uh, categories, it's been shown that you can find Fabry patients. And then, of course, uh, if, if the, the frequency or, or the hit rate is high enough, then it becomes really relevant to continue to do so. Now, there are more than 6,000 rare diseases, so this makes it very difficult for doctors to recognize symptoms and think about a rare disease. What could be a possible solution for this problem? Yes, that's also a very good question. I don't really have a solution to that problem. And uh, on the contrary, I think that we, as doctors, we are supposed to think of more common diseases first and rule those out. And then only uh, later on during the, the diagnostic workup, we are even allowed to think about rare diseases. It is impossible for a human brain to contain all the information necessary to diagnose all these rare diseases, let alone to be able 
to uh, distinguish between the more common presentations and do that reliably and, and uh, foolproof. So uh, I think it is important that colleagues are convinced of the fact that there are rare diseases. There might be some of those rare diseases for which treatment is available. So it, it is important that colleagues are convinced that it's worthwhile to continue your diagnostic process until, until you find a diagnosis. And then again, especially for treatable rare diseases, but the, um, the spectrum of treatable rare diseases is expanding and these, these diseases can present in very, uh, very variable ways. Uh, and, and for many of these rare diseases, it, the, the whole spectrum of, of the phenotype isn't even known. So how would you recognize something that hasn't been described yet even? So I think it's becoming more and more important that we are screening for rare diseases in a more upfront way. Uh, some people are talking about uh, genomes first. So if you have a patient who presents with a, a panel of, of medical problems that you cannot make sense of, then you should be screening the whole genome just to, uh, to make sure that there isn't some kind of genetic predisposition or a genetic disease behind this phenotype. Uh, so that uh, rules out the doctor thinking or having any knowledge. So you just go ahead and screen genetically. But that then makes abstraction of the, the fact that someone has to be interpreting all these data that you generate by genome screening. And so someone still has to uh, understand the genetic variants that are being described in a specific patient. And if those are compatible with the, the phenotype the patient presents with, so it still requires a human brain to integrate all the information. And then lastly, what we see in, in, in many fields, uh, more and more uh, fields in our, in our society, is that we are starting to, uh, to use uh, artificial brains, artificial intelligence to support decision making. And I actually truly believe that uh, using artificial intelligence or learning algorit uh, algorithms to support our decision making in medicine that is uh, becoming more and more common in, in, uh, in, in daily uh, decision making in, in hospitals and, and in practices of, uh, of colleagues. But um, I also think that it could be helpful in the context of uh, reminding doctors that these diseases exist and where it is justified to initiate uh, the diagnostics for these, uh, these diseases. Um, I'm, I'm involved in a project with a company, a Belgian company, that is designing uh, a tool for doctors in, in first line, second line, third line practices, where patients are asked a, a very specific set of questions that is very intelligently designed and also individualized based on the, the presenting complaint and the background of the patient. And it allows you to reach a differential diagnostic list much quicker than, uh, than a human brain would be capable. Of course, this is a system that needs years and years of training, but in fact, it's already ongoing, that training, and it's uh, going to be used more and more often. So this is a Belgian company called Bingley that is using artificial intelligence to reach uh, a more specific list of uh, differential diagnostic possibilities based on a few questions asked to a patient and looking at the complaints the patient presents with. And if we doctors uh, are not too proud to allow artificial intelligence to support us in our daily decision making, then I think this could be very helpful. You've listened to the first part of this podcast. If you're eager to learn more about testing, treatment and follow-up of Fabry patients, well, you can also listen to the second part of this interview with Professor Kassiman. Thank you for listening and stay tuned.